where the Rite Aid is and the Whitestone Shopping Center. Before that, it was Eckerd. And before that, it was Genovese. But before it was Genovese, half of the, what now constitutes the drugstore was actually a movie theater. And it had only two screens. One screen showed a modern film. One screen showed a revival film. On Saturdays and Sundays, they had cartoons. I saw Jack and the Beanstalk there. I saw the Fox and the Hound. And I saw, I think, I think Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and also E.T. So that was my introduction to movies, was in that two-screen movie theater in the Wiseau Shopping Center. And today, you can still see evidence that, it's a Weiss, uh, that it was a movie theater, <coughs> because in back of the Wiseau Shopping Center along 14th Avenue, when you see the back of, of the shopping center, you see two doors. Okay, they're painted shut. Those were the exits. So when the movie was over, the crowd would be dispersed onto 14th Avenue and pushed out through that exit. And those exit ways are still there to this very day, but they're painted <coughs> shut. So here we have a view of, if everyone remembers, at the beginning of the presentation, I showed the Smith Estate, which became the Powell Estate, which became the pathway for the Cross Island Parkway. This is an opposite side view of the Smith slash Powell Estate, which was known also as Wolf Pit Hill. Um, here is the Long Island Sound, and this view might look familiar because all of this property was demolished in the late 1930s for the building of one of the biggest things to come to Whitestone since the Long Island Railroad, and that was a bridge connecting Queens with the Bronx. It was a pet project by Robert Moses, who we all know built uh, many of the city's big infrastructure projects. Uh, this uh, bridge was built to coincide with the opening of the first World's Fair, the 1939-40 World's Fair in Flushing Meadows Park. Then there would be the second World's Fair in 1964-1965. So the bridge was built as part, as uh, not directly related to the fair, but to show off New York City and to, sh and to handle the high volume of traffic that was expected to come into the area. Also, the uh, bridge was seen as a completion point of the Belt Parkway system, because as you know, you could come off the bridge, be into the Cross Island, the Cross Island goes south, and you can go into the southern state and, and also towards Kennedy Airport. So, <coughs> this is a construction photo of the Whitestone Bridge. These are the men stringing the cables, the support cables, this is looking towards Whitestone. This is um, in January of 1939. So this is 90 days before the bridge opened. You see they're getting the, the roadway over here to the right. They're getting it ready. They're paving it. They're putting blacktop. You have the beautiful antique light posts across the bridge, which were made out of wood. They were wooden lamp posts, and they were there up until the 60s before they were removed. So this is a great, you could, you could really see, I mean, how cold it was. You could see how bundled up they are, and you could really, I just get chilly looking at this photo, you know what I'm saying? Like I could feel the, the cold hitting me in my face. It, must, it was grueling work. So it was designed by Othmar Aman, who was also the man who designed the Throgs Neck Bridge as well. Here is another view of the men stringing the support cables along the bridge with a special machine designed only for the sole purpose of, of stringing those cables along, those support cables along the bridge, along the span. So this is them posing proudly before that piece of machinery. And here's the opening day of the bridge, which was also the opening of that section of the Cross Island Parkway. So here we have the Whitestone Bridge here. This is now the Cross Island Service Road, heading towards 150th Street and 14th Avenue. You have the overpasses. You see the beautiful old cars, but notice how you can make a U-turn. <laughs> so you have all of this, this uh, like island in the middle, all grass, and then here at this break point, you can make a nice U-turn in case you're going the wrong way. I wouldn't suggest doing that today. Um, <coughs> over here, uh, before was the Cross Island Parkway. This, as you know, it's now the Cross Island Service Road. But before the parkway, the service road was known as 15th Avenue. 15th Avenue was then pushed south to the other side of the expressway, and these two became the service roads. So, as we move into the modern time, 
1950s, uh, PS30 is gone. So now we have a new public school. This is where I went to public school. This is the Alfred J. Kennedy School. This is PS193. Okay, this is 152nd Street and 12th Avenue. 154th Street would be right over here. This is the rear entrance. And if you notice, 12th Avenue between 152nd and 154th, 12th Avenue doesn't go all the way through. It's all rocks and trees and muddy fields. So even in the 50s, there were still streets that they didn't cut all the way through, which is something quite remarkable. And it wasn't until the school opened uh, in September of 1954, six months after this photo was taken, that 12th Avenue was thrown open and linked 152nd with 154th Street. This is another view. Uh, as you can see, there's no, um, there's no cross street, and you see it's all mud. All mud and little ponds and property here that was taken down. Some of these homes still remain, but this, but what would have been the cross street here in the rear of the school at the time were the backyards of these homes. So even in the 1950s up until the 60s, it was kind of a rural area. Here's another angle of PS193. This is uh, <coughs> 12th Avenue coming back before 154th Street. This is showing um, from another angle. And as you can see, the street would be right here. But it's all woodland. It's all trees with just a little sidewalk cutting through this little wooded area. So this is coming. So 154th Street would be right here. And this would eventually become, a, couple, a few months later, 12th Avenue. Here's where the playground is located today. And as you know, on the other side of 12th Avenue over here are homes. So those homes didn't exist. It was all wooded area. So moving now into the 60s, we have the Prospect Bridge. This is a great photo because it shows no roadway. So, yeah, man, <laughs> it's a big surprise anybody got on. So here we have Fort Schuyler in the Bronx. We have this lone construction worker walking along the catwalk towards the clean side of the Frog's Neck Bridge. This bridge was the uh, last suspension bridge to be built in the city because the, it was slated to be the last one, uh, but it was uh, the construction on the Verrazano Bridge was delayed. So this became the next to last suspension bridge built in the city of New York. And then in 1964, the Verrazano Bridge became the final one to be built. So this one was actually conceived before, um, uh, excuse me, uh, after Verrazano, but was built before it. One of the big things that happened with the Verrazano Bridge were that a lot of people uh, who credit Robert Moses as being the the sinister figure behind it were evicted from their homes, pushed out of their homes. And this also happened here in Queens and in the Bronx as well. You know, when you come over into the Bronx side, the first thing you reach is the Toll Plaza. There were many homes and a couple apartment buildings there. All of those people were evicted and displaced, their property destroyed to make way for the Toll Plaza. And on the Queens side, when you get off of the Throgs Neck Bridge, you go right into the Clearview, right? Well, from the clear view between that point and the Hillside Avenue were all homes and businesses and little communities. Even a synagogue was there. All of these things were completely demolished to make way for the clear view, which was supposed to go beyond Hillside Avenue, but was stopped right there. And that's why it's called uh, the expressway to nowhere. And in a way, it is. I'm not saying there's wrong with anything wrong with Hillside Avenue. We still. So. So, so the Throgs Neck Bridge becomes the final big change in Whitestone. Uh, by the 1960s, everything that we have here is pretty much everything we have. It, by 1960, everything that is built is what we have here today. Uh, 1958 was the building of La Harve apartment houses in Beechhurst, along with Crider Point, which is where I live. The, um, the Crider House also was built to accommodate the increase in population. And really, the history of Whitestone, although there always are historic things happening in our town, 
It really concludes with the opening of the Throgs Neck Bridge on January 11, 1961. Uh, the bridge was also, um, and uh, just a little funny story about the bridge. On January 11, 1961, there was the big ribbon cutting ceremony in the Bronx. So everyone was at the toll <coughs> plaza, they had the big ribbon, there was a big motorcade that had Robert Moses, it had the mayor of New York in it, it had the governor, it had everybody. It had, I believe it was Governor Rockefeller at the time. And they were all in the motorcade ready for the ribbon to be cut so they could go from the Bronx to the Queens side. And right before the <laughs> ribbon was cut, a guy on a bicycle cuts in front of the motorcade, goes under the ribbon, and heads over the Throgs Neck Bridge. So the photo of the first vehicle going over the bridge is a guy on his bike, and all of the construction workers were cheering him. Telling him go, 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 go. So, so that's basically it. That's the, uh, in a nutshell, the uh, a concise history of our town. Uh, our town still continues to grow. In the year 2000 survey, we were estimated at 40,000 people living in Whitestone, Beechhurst, and Malva combined. I'm sure that figure has grown uh, today. And, uh, you know, for the first 300 years, we did pretty good, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more history to come in the next two to 300 years. So this is where my story ends. I want to thank everybody for coming. Yes, and uh, from April 1960, April 4th, 1960, in January, that's when they built the roadway. So in just eight months, it went from being just a shell to a fully functioning suspension park. It's quite incredible. If anybody has any questions? No? Okay. Yes, sir. Behind the back. Bridge Lane, where the high wall is behind Bridge Lane, was that the railroad path through there? Yes, it was. Significance? Yes, okay. that's why I have in the, when you go to the mobile station, and you, you can actually look up at Clintonville Street. Yeah. That's why Clintonville Street is higher. Um, I know it breaks place to falling out. I used, used to go to, to the birthday parties right. there, sure. Right. And uh, I think the Queen's Tribune is there today. So yeah, that's why Clintonville Street is higher than the Sunoco station is because yeah. it was, there was a pathway underneath for the train to pass. Yes, sir? The Mary Pickford House, is that the one on House Cove? It is. Um, the showman asked about the Mary Pickford home in uh, Powell's Cove and Beechers. Uh, just to touch on a quick subject that I, I overlooked, Whitestone uh, in the 1920s and in the teens was a unique community because it became a magnet for not only businessmen and families in Manhattan who wanted to come to a quiet setting, but it became the magnet for artists and stars of the early film industry. So before there was Beverly Hills, there was Whitestone. And we had Mary Pickford, we had Charlie Chaplin, we had Douglas Fairbanks, we have the uh, Rudolph Valentino home, okay, on Willits Point, which was Valentino's restaurant, and now, it, actually, no, it's Valentino's now, it was Cafe on the Green, and that structure, 80% of it is the Valentino home. He built it for himself, and then he died just a couple of years later. He died very young, I think he was only 22 when he died, Valentino. So there were a lot of uh, artists. Uh, where the Kreider House is today was the home of Harvey Firestone, founder of Firestone Tires. So you had a lot of important people in that home is the Mary Pickford home. Mary Pickford was the, one of the first big stars of the silent film era. She was one of the, probably the first leading lady in, in Hollywood history was Mary Pickford. I think somebody here had a question. Oh, yes, sir. And uh, key food there, before they uh, rebuild it inside, they used to have some old pictures you know, against the wall. I yes. Know what I remember, I don't know, I wonder what happened. There. And the uh, gentleman said that in the key food uh, shopping, in the key food supermarket, in the Whitestone Shopping Center, uh, there were those photos by the checkout line. Some of them I showed today. Uh, just a quick note about these photos. Uh, some of them come donated from people who live in the community. Uh, one of the stories when I was doing research for this book, I actually went door to door asking people for photographs and I was told by my dentist that one of his patients was a 90 year old woman living in Whitestone who had lived in that house her entire life. So I knocked on her door, I stood back, she came to the door a little suspicious, I explained who I was, I explained to her who, her, who referred me to her 
and I told her what I was doing. And she looked at me and she said, so you want photos? I said, yes. She goes, I had many photos of the railroad, of the farms, and I said, well, I noticed she said had, not have. And she said, young man, I've held those photos for decades. And my family didn't want them, my, fa my friends didn't want them, so I threw them all away. And here you are today asking me for those photos. So, but a lot of this stuff comes not only donated from community members, but it also comes from the wonderful Queens Library System, okay? It comes from the Queens Historical Society, the Bayside Historical Society, and the, just a quick note about that, we have these wonderful places that you could go to research, not only the history of Whitestone, but the history of Queens and greater New York, and the best part is you don't, go, you don't have to go to Manhattan to do it. You have the Queens Historical Society in Flushing, off of 37th Avenue and Parsons Boulevard in the Kingsland Homestead. They are open free to the public. They have an archive there which is open free to the public by appointment. You have the Bayside Historical Society in Fort Totten. You have the Poppin Hoosen Institute in College Point, all free to the public. And then finally, of course, is the Queens Public Library, the Central Library on Merrick Boulevard in Jamaica. The second floor is known as the Long Island Division, now known as the Archives, and they have over two million photographs. You can look by street if you want. They have maps, the old the, uh, deeds for the property, everything that you could want, and it's all free. You can go there. There's no appointment necessary. They just give you a pass at the front desk. They're open seven days a week, and their staff is very, very knowledgeable. If you've ever been to the Central Library, it could be kind of hectic, but once you get to the second floor, it's like you're in a in another world. So that's where a lot of these photos come from, including something like this. This is something that I acquired recently. This is an original photo of a building that was just knocked down recently in Whitestone. If everybody remembers, across from Harpel on 150th and 14th was the Tiamo, okay? That was just knocked down. And this is a, a photo of that building from 1892 of the Excelsior Meat Market with the family out in the front. Uh, Excelsior, a lot of businesses were called Excelsior in those days because Excelsior is the state motto. The state motto of New York State is Excelsior. Okay, and this is an original photo of the family in front of their butcher shop, the Excelsior